Okay, um, so can I welcome uh, the committee and members of the public to this meeting of the London Assembly Housing Committee. The main item today will be a discussion with our invited guests on how Transport for London is using its land to support residential property development. And members of the public can follow the meeting on the webcast and on Twitter using the hashtags Assembly Housing and TFL Land. Please can I remind members, guests and the audience to turn your phones off or put them on silent. And can I ask if any apologies have been received? Uh, apologies for absence have been received uh, from Assemblymember Gavron, for whom Assemblymember Ashlomi is attending a substitute, and Assemblymember Curtin. Thank you very much. Um, item two on the agenda is declarations of interest. Can I ask members to note the list of offices on the report and ask if you have any additional interests to declare? None. No. Sure. Thank you, members. Um, item three is the minutes of the last meeting held on the 22nd of January 2019. Can we agree the minutes from our previous meeting? Thank you. Um, item four is the summary list of actions. Can I ask members to note the outstanding actions arising from previous meetings? Thank you. Uh, item five is action taken under delegated authority. Can I ask the committee to note the action taken since the last meeting? Thank you. Thank you. Item six is uh, the response to the Housing Committee report, Hearing Resident Voices in Social Housing. Can I ask the committee to note the Mayor's response to our report, which is attached at Appendix 1, and note the report impact review, which is attached at Appendix 2 of the agenda. Noted. Thank you very much. Right, so that brings us to item seven, which is today's main item um, on an update on the use of Transport for London land to build Homes. Um, our members' briefings cover the item in more detail. Uh, can I welcome our guests? Uh, we have Graham Craig, who is the Commercial Development Director at Transport for London. We have Daniel Lovett, who is the Head of Property Development at Transport for London. We have Councillor Claire Coghill, who is the leader of the London Borough of Waltham Forest, in which some of this land exists. Uh, we have Liana Etkind, who is the Campaigns Manager for the London Community Land Trust, who have won some TFL land, so we'll be talking to you later on. Um, so yes, wanted to get started on looking really at how Transport for London is doing at reaching the quite ambitious targets that we've discussed before. Um, on the committee previously, we produced a report, Homes Down the Track, that recognised how ambitious this was, this was and made recommendations for how to speed things up. Um, just before we start, we asked um, in advance of this meeting for updated data on the progress um, towards the targets. We first asked you on the 16th of January, Graham, <laughs> so that we'd have time to give it proper scrutiny. Now, unfortunately, we've received a lot of information in a big table, um, but we received that um, only a few days ago. We haven't had time to, to really delve into that properly, so we're going to do some delving during the meeting. But, but can I ask why it took so long to get data on, on what's going on with your developments to, to the level of detail that we wanted? Um, first of all, I apologise for the length of time uh, that it took. Um, I guess what we were wrestling with is, A, it's live data, uh, so literally every week we've got new information. Also conscious that it's commercially sensitive data. We're making decisions, again, literally every week with partners. So trying to provide information which is meaningful, but not making transparent to those people who are aware of which partner it is that we're working with. Also conscious that um, we've shared information in which we're being more public than we have been in the past um, with our plans for schemes and conscious that we haven't gone through proper process, local engagement, talking to partners, all of which really isn't an excuse. I, you know, I'm not going to pretend that um, we ought not to have got the information but before we did. We were trying to reconcile um, doing things properly, avoiding procurement risks, sharing information, and we were guilty, I think, of trying to perfect what came to you rather than giving you the information. In general, I will say, we can always be much more... Uh, transparent, much clearer in a private session, so individually or collectively as a committee, if you ever want to delve into detail, and I suspect this is part of what we'll come to in the session itself, if on particular schemes you want to understand not necessarily or not only what's here, but what we actually think is going to happen and how we might get to those points, uh, it's always much easier for us to be more transparent 
in a behind closed door session. Okay, thank you very much for that. Just on that point. Sorry, Andrew, yes. Yeah, we're we're going to ask this, these Take questions again in future. Can you give us an undertaking that yes. in future, when we ask for it, we can get something? Of we course. totally understand that yeah. there are certain things that may have to be left out. We're not, we're not silly like that. But it, it does get in the way of proper scrutiny if we have to wait to literally hours before the meeting before we can get data. I so apologize. I would appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Point yeah. noted. Um, the other thing um, I wanted to ask was, um, obviously it, it is helpful to get this information out into public as soon as possible. I appreciate what you're saying about um, essentially not wanting to alarm local communities by, by saying we want to build a thousand homes on this site and then for them, for them not to know what's going on. Um, I can totally see that you, know, you might say in a local community, well, you know, where are these plans? What, what plans have been made? Who, what's being cut from us? But if this is all the information there is, getting it out in public is, is actually quite useful and it starts a conversation. Potentially then local groups can start making their own plans, as it were, and coming forward with ideas for you. And I think it is, it is good to be transparent. Are you planning to put this kind of information out on websites you know, in, a, in a more sort of engaging, transparent form in future? Because not many people are going to, I mean, we're, the, the housing committee people might come and look at what we're doing to find out more but we're not the main method of reaching the public on what transport for london are doing we have a lot of information on our website um, it is a significant task to maintain that up to date when literally every week elements of it change i think there's more we could do to make it up to date and there's more that we could do to point people towards that website um, i think we will come to it, but over the course of this year, I think we'll be bringing forward planning applications at the rate of about one a week. Um, there is no avoiding the fact that there is a huge amount of activity. We have to take local people with us. Uh, our ability to take local people with us is probably the single biggest challenge that we have in delivering the programme. Again, that's something that we'll come to. Um, and it's fair to say that we, you know, I recognise, um, have to do much, much more in order to make sure that people are cited in advance in terms of under understanding the scale of development activity that we're undertaking across the capital. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, and now I'll we'll start talking about the actual data that you've given us, if that's okay. Um, so what, what we were discussing um, in the previous report that we wrote was, was the fact that, that TfL set an original deadline of March 2020 for 10,000 homes to be started on its quite extensive land. Um, as I understand it, that deadline's now been moved back to March 2021 to fit in more with the funding schedule. Um, but how many starts do you think are going to meet that original deadline now? Okay. Um, I guess two things to say. One, we've been working to the March 21 for... I think in excess of two years, yeah, it was sort of end of 2016 that we've been working to 2020, 2021. So as long as we've had a resourced programme, a funded programme, um, you know, we had a aspiration that we set out in terms of 2020, but for as long as we've had a plan, a real plan, that plan has been pointing us to um, starting on site to deliver 10,000 homes by March 21. So we don't have we're not measuring against where we are by march 2020 realistically we will have started on sites that will deliver hundreds of homes um potentially depending on time scales maybe reaching a thousand something like that but there's no avoiding the fact that this is a back-ended program the vast majority of sites we will start uh construction on those sites during the year 20 2020 21. Okay, so you're, what you're saying is essentially possibly a thousand by the original deadline of 2020, but then a huge number in the final year uh, yes, to reach I'm, more I'm, or less the deadline that you were going to reach. 10, I'm 000. reiterating the fact that from the time that we had a program, mm -hmm. a resource program, a funded program for two and a half years. Um, we've been working to a deadline of March 21. Uh, that's what we're focusing in on. Um, and sat here, we have an activity, we have a plan, um, not complacent by any means, but we believe that we will hit the starting on site to deliver 10,000 homes by March 21. 
Um, we're, I am perfectly happy, of course, to give you updates on how we do, how we are doing against uh, the earlier date of March 2020, uh, but our focus is on achieving the target that we have agreed uh, in line uh, w in, with the Homes for Londoners Board of 10,000 starts by March 21. Okay, um, and in terms of the stages things are at at the moment, how many are actually under construction now? How many are in planning, as it were, how many have planning permission? Um, and how many are selected partners, you know, you've got a deal and you just haven't, what sort, how many are you, where are you at in terms of those different stages? Okay, um, started construction on 313. Um, in terms of with planning, um, that would be almost 5,000. Um, sorry, uh, sorry, we've submitted planning, uh, almost 5,000. Um, it's 1,250 over the course of the last uh, 12 months. Um, the sort of macro position is that by the end, literally of this week, we will have partners identified for all 10,000. So that then gives us two years in order to get planning and get on site uh, across the 51 sites, the um, 320 acres that will deliver the starting on sites to deliver 10,000 10, homes. You said by the end of this week you'll have partners for all 10,000. Uh, we're at 7,000 oh. at the moment and Dan... So you're going to uh, sign a deal on 3,000 this week? Yes. Go on. Well, we're, we're going to appoint the partner to deliver the built to rent portfolio, 3,000 mm. by Friday. There's still days left. Yeah. So that you can't... <laughs> we'll, we'll ask you more questions about that, but you yeah. can't tell us who that is today then. Well, we, we're in the middle of a... Well, we're at the end of a live procurement process which hasn't quite finished, so... It, Parts of it will be commercially sensitive, so I can talk about what I can talk about, but there are bits that um, there's probably three bidders watching this session, for example, so we just need to be very careful with what we talk about here, not to prejudice the procurement process to be um, transparent. Okay, great. Um, and then, in terms of small sites, what proportion will the small sites contribute towards the target? Um, last year we brought to market 10 sites, 198 homes. Um, um, November last year uh, we brought forward Woolwich, that was 45. Um, and we have uh, another series of sites that we have um, passed over to the GLA and we'll be issuing a press release possibly as early as next week. Um, that those are coming to market uh, and that from memory but it's on my briefing note somewhere is probably again uh, another 90 or so sites. 90 and sites? Sorry, um, 90 homes. So we've got eight, eight more sites, 90 homes. So in total um, 300 or so, um, so about 3% uh, how many sites, how many small sites is that in total? I probably could have uh, that out. As 20, spoke. roughly. 20? 19. 19. Uh, so, and well, we'll, again, we'll come to small sites. Small sites are, from our point of view, in some respects, many times, no less, no more straightforward. You know, we... We can hit the targets, but in order to hit the targets, we have to make sure that if we bring a site forward, it can be developed out. We cannot afford to start on a site and then fail to bring it forward. All of our sites are op um, op operationally constrained in some way, so we have to be clear that whether we're working with large developers, community land trusts or anyone else, if we're bringing a site forward, we are confident that it can, can be brought forward. So we do a lot of work up front in terms of understanding, quantifying, mitigating, uh, operational and planning risk. Um, we absolutely think that bringing small sites is important. There's a fantastic opportunity for us to work with a different range of organisations than we would do on the large sites. There's opportunity for innovation, there's opportunity for you know, high quality um, uh, design. We do have a discrete team that focuses in on small sites um, and there's a lot of effort that we put in in order to bring those forward.
Okay, um, I mean, that brings me on to the next question, really. All of this information on these charts, this is quite a few sites, but it's definitely not all of your land. What has determined whether something appears on these tables and what's determined how, you know, the small sites that you give us? There, there's, a, there's, there's further potential in your land to bring forward sites, is, is there not? after these are done? Uh, there is indeed. So when I think about uh, small sites, it, it'll tend to be... Big sites as well, I'm asking about. Yeah, OK. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but if we think about small sites first, we will end up bringing to market something between 1 in 5 and 1 in 10 of the small sites that we first look at. Um, there are reasons why we're not in a position to bring those forward, and sometimes we're not able to bring it forward just at that point in time, but we... Um, you know, continue to keep a watching brief on that site and look to bring it forward at some point in the future. It's by no means the case that when we start feasibility on a site that but by any point we're confident that that individual site uh, can be brought forward. You know, th there's a lot of work sometimes, months of work that has to go in up front. Um, in total, individual parcels of land, um, I think we've got 10,000 individual parcels of land across London, as, as you know well, um, uh, 5,700 acres, 1.5% of uh, land in London is held by TfL. Again, reiterating that includes roads and tracks and stations and depots. You know, this is all in some way operationally constrained land, but clearly we are, we have been and conti continue to be focused on how we might uh, unlock the maximum amount of that land. I haven't seen this. We get the data late. We haven't made a total of the amount of hectares of land that's on these tables. Can you tell us how much in area you've brought forward so far? 320 acres. 320 acres out of potentially? 5,700. And 5,700 is your developable land or just no, no, your that's land? All, all the land that we've got, including, as I say, the tracks, the stations, um, the roads. So what proportion of the de potentially developable land have you brought forward in these schemes so far? Everything that we've identified to date, you won't be surprised to know. I mean, literally, if we think, it, we, we do the work, we identify the op opportunity. If we can, then bring it forward. We're keen to bring it to market as fast as we can. We have every incentive in the world, from a financial point of view, from a housing point of view, to bring forward land as fast as we can. There isn't some... Uh, reservoir of land that we are hang hanging on to. If we, if we can bring it forward then we do so. We've got um, 51 sites, 320 acres to deliver the first 10,000 homes. Um, I think we're at the point now where you know we have a plan, it's a credible plan, again not um, in any way downplaying the risks but I think we are confident we can hit those first 10,000 homes. Our focus is now therefore on what we want, you know, what the, where the next 10,000 homes are going to come from, and maybe we can we can talk about that later. Um, I'm also conscious of the fact that we have identified, we believe, sites that could deliver 2.4 million square feet of commercial space, and we're keen to work on those, which you know goes beyond the strict remit of this committee. But obviously, again, from a financial point of view, it is of interest to TfL, and clearly there's also the separate team working on small sites and we're keen uh, to continue to progress bringing those forward as fast as fast as we can. OK, great. Has somebody member Copley had a follow-up question before we move on? I did, me? yeah, on, on the stats. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just had a query about um, the Earls Court development, because that's obviously a huge chunk of... Um, it's 15, 1,508, I can see on here, uh, of the homes that are due to be built, and it seems to be in, in limbo at the moment. Now, some of us, like myself, might be welcoming the prospect of a new planning application coming forward with a lot more affordable housing because it's, I have to say it's a rather pitiful level and, and the, the potentially the West Ken and Gibbs Green Estates being handed back to Hammersmith and Fulham which is what the Mayor has said but uh, he wants but um, is this going to have a, 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 an impact or you know it, it, this delay going to have an impact on your ability to deliver out 10,000 starts by 2021? Um, we need to find a solution for Earl's Court. We want to, you know, the Mayor has made plain um, that he wants to see the two estates handed back. 
um, Mayor has also made plain and we share um, that we want to see a London plan compliance scheme brought forward. Um, we are in discussions with the GLA, with the London Borough of Hammersmith and Fulham, as well as um, Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, uh, and of course Capco. Uh, ultimately, we're talking here about, um, from an Earl's Court point of view, 26 acres of cleared site. That's tw 26 acres of cleared site that can be um, home to thousands of Londoners that, n that need a home. Um, I'm also conscious that we have a depot site, Lily Bridge Depot, 16 acres that we own are unencumbered. Um, that's currently a heavily used op op operational depot. Um, we do believe that the facilities undertaken on that site could be moved elsewhere. That potentially gives us a further 16 acres, so a total of 42 acres of West London that we would be keen to see. Um, thousands of homes and a you know, significant community being built around those three stations. Um, so we are keen to see it, keen to see it brought forward um, in discussions, as I say, with all interested parties. And I would hope that in you know, the months ahead, we would be in a position to um, uh, announce uh, a start um, or a plan uh, that would enable that site to be brought forward. And do you envisage that plan will be with or without CAPCO? Or is that not a question you can answer in a public meeting? Um, at this stage, uh, my main focus is that we have a plan that's a London plan compliant programme. That really is the focus. OK, thank you. <laughs> Assemblymember Ashley, you wanted to ask about? Yeah, so just going back to some of those targets and some of the sites that have been identified, um, you'll recall that shortly after... Um, the elections, there was an announcement from TF1, I think you were quoted in that press release around Landmark Court, yes. which is in my constituency in Southwark, and the ambition to build over, um, I think it was at that time, over 120 homes. Yep. And when the preferred developers were selected in July 2017, that figure had changed to 80 homes, so again, still quite high, but not as high as we'd like to see. And bearing in mind that um, this is a site that TfL have owned for over 25 years and, and, and plus on, on a site that was part of the original Jubilee line and that ambition from the Mayor and TfL to develop on these sites that essentially been sat on for years and bring forward homes. I think I was quite surprised, a number of people were surprised when the final, the latest um, announcement for that site was identifying 35 homes and of that only eight were going to be for social rent so how did we get to a situation where again everyone's definitely agreeing that we need to bring forward new homes on TfL land there's a great ambition from right across um, TfL and, and the mayor an announcement for 120 is now an announcement to 35 and of that 35 only eight go to local residents in terms of social rent how where did those changes and how, how, how were those agreed in those discussions with the developers? Okay. It's a great example of the challenges that we face on an individual site by site basis. Um, so the 120 homes was based on a, a fully residential scheme. Uh, when we came to have the first conversations with the London Borough of Southwark, they made plain that they saw that as being a mixed-use site. Uh, that was also the feedback that we got from uh, the developers to whom we spoke. Um, so the initial fall from 120 uh, homes to 80 was brought about because we're looking not at a fully residential scheme but a mixed-use scheme. Um, the most recent development is that London Borough of Southwark officers requested that we reduce down the scale and height, um, and that resulted in a loss of 2,000 square metres that we lost from the site. Now, we absolutely understand uh, where London Borough of Southwark officers are coming from, but we're then faced with how then we deal with that in terms of the site that we bring forward. Um, I have a number of targets that I have to hit. Two of the ones that, you know, 
two of the important targets that I have to hit is to, as a team, we must bring forward those 10,000 10, homes with starch by March uh, 21 and deliver the 50% affordable housing as an average across the piece. I also have, as well as those ambitious housing targets, ambitious financial targets because, of course, all the revenue that we raise gets reinvested in the transport network. In this particular case, um, the values are much stronger in that part of Southwark for commercial rather than housing. So um, the view that we came to was with that loss of 2,000 square metres, um, we would reduce down the residential and maintain the commercial. Now obviously that's something that we gave significant thought to. Um, we could have taken a different view. But actually, if you look at the financial quantum in relation to the number of homes, um, the impact was 175,000 per home as the differential between reducing down at that particular location given overall reduced density um, by reducing down commercial rather than residential, 175,000 per home. Given the targets that we have across the piece, the decision that we came to was clearly we still need to hit the 10,000 across the piece, but we're better off investing in order to deliver housing in other parts of, on other sites across London. And this is one where, on balance, we would reduce down the residential to 35 units in order to, um, uh, you know, from a financial point of view, notwithstanding the fact that clearly we still have to hit the 10,000 and we have to hit the 50% affordable as an average across the whole portfolio. But, so correct me if I'm wrong, Graham, the initial proposals for the 120 homes, that would have been worked out with your team and additional TfL planners and, and, and housing to say this could be achieved on this site. Um, an exercise was undertaken, yes, probably three years ago, that was looking at a fully residential scheme. So, in response to the question, if you know how many homes could we build on that site, we came up with a view of um, 120. But that was pre-discussions with any developers and pre-discussions with the London Borough of Southwark. So, essentially, it's going back to the question around your targets and how you're going to reach this. If you're taking, if if TfL and your team are then looking at the various sites that TfL own, not Southwark own, TfL own, so essentially it's up to TfL what's built on those sites in discussion with the planning authorities. If TfL are taking this view on a number of sites that TfL own, and essentially you're going to be, you could be going back and forth to say, well actually we won't build the homes, this site's more lucrative in terms of revenue. Is this the case that we're going to have on all these other sites going forward? Some of them are still in development when you have those additional discussions. If that's the case, this target that you've got, which is very ambitious and which all of us want to see, you're going to struggle to hit that. Um, the single biggest risk that we have is getting these sites through planning. Oh, I say the single biggest risk now. Um, if you go back two years, three years, I'd have said uh, the biggest risk or the closest risk at that stage was identifying the sites to bring forward. Then the risk becomes how do we get the developers, the partners in place. You know, let's not underestimate the challenge of procuring those numbers of sites. We have got to the point where lit, um, lit, literally at the end of this week we'll have partners on board for 51 sites, 320 acres, 10,000 homes. Without question, the challenge we have now is getting through planning and as I say, at the rate of one a week. Um, that places a significant strain on the 20, 20 uh, boroughs that we need to talk through. It also um, is a significant strain from our point of view in terms of managing all of those you know, comms and engagement act activities across yeah. London. I am confident that we will get planning, um, but doing so at the pace that's required in order to hit these numbers is extraordinary. Part of what we'll have to do in order to achieve that is to work very closely with the boroughs on an individual site-by-site -site basis. We'll have some more questions on that okay. shortly, sorry. <laughs> but yeah, that, that is useful to know. Is that, can I? And that's fine, yeah. but what I'd, my plea is to, um, if that's the case, and, you're, and I fully appreciate, all of us fully appreciate that you have to work with a range of developers, but maybe TFR should be looking at which developers you're working with. 
and actually seeking to work with developers who are going to bring forward the aspiration of building more homes, not just looking at the profits and revenue that TfL, which again, I'm on the Transport Committee, I fully appreciate TfL's finances, but we have waiting lists of over 25,000 um, people in, in various boroughs, including the two boroughs I represent. If we're going to be looking at sites which TfL own, and again we're going back to, okay, we'll take the revenue instead of the homes, it's not helping everyone. And I guess all I can say is that you know part of our job is to balance those things. Ultimately, decisions are made, um, you know, within TfL, but um, in conjunction with with City Hall, and we have to make the call, and that involves uh, seeking to balance our objectives across the portfolio with what we can achieve on an individual site by site basis. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we'll, we will be asking further questions on that again later on um, in terms of um, whether or not your sites that deliver the most affordable homes are further away from where the need is. I think that's the point you're getting at. Um, Sonia McGough, you wanted to follow up on something before we move on to the <coughs> Crossrail question. Yes, you asked, you said that uh, your, your main concentration at the moment and task at the moment is to ensure that you have a London plan compliant programme. Is that correct? Um, well, tell me I'm not right if, if I've misunderstood what you said. Um, I, what you said. I said that we have targets to deliver 10,000 homes by March 21 and to deliver an average of 50% uh, affordable housing for all those sites brought, brought forward uh, post May 16 uh, in terms of being affordable housing. Whether or not that's what I said, that's what I ought to have said. Right, right. Thank you for that. That makes it clearer. Um, to, to what extent has that 50% target meant that you've had to delay bringing sites to, uh, to the market? It's not delayed us. It means that we have to work harder. You know, we have to look across the piece and balance which are the sites that we might be bringing forward at 35, 40% affordable housing versus those we might bring forward at 50, 75, 100. It is a, you know, there are few organisations that have ever sought to do this amount of development across London. We have, you know, we have built up a brilliant team across you know development uh, communications uh, planning engineering we've got a fantastic team but you know make no avoiding we have to work hard in order to deliver the affordable housing and to balance that um, with the financial targets i would say that we've hit our financial targets every year and this year again as we did last year by the end of this year we will have brought forward over 3,000 homes to market and we will have hit the 50% affordable housing. I'm not saying it's straightforward, but we have been able to achieve it last year and this year, and expect us to, to do the same next year. So that 3,000 homes is from that initial aspiration of bringing 10,000 homes forward, you're saying you've for the last 3,000? For the last two years, as the first wave of activity, we obviously have to bring sites to market. And yeah. last year, as well as this year, we have got the partners in place for 3,000 homes in each of those years. Right. So we're still stuck with this, this back-ended programme where we've got to be confident that you're going to be able to Start, start on the site in that 2021. To what, to what, 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 why are you so confident that you can do that? Um, can I just say there's no avoiding the fact if it's a back-ended programme. If you're literally taking operational land or car parks or whatever it is and you're having to do the work to understand the operational constraints, uh, address those clean up the site, be, you know, have clarity on title, bring it to market, get a partner on board, get planning. There is no avoiding the fact that that takes years, um, particularly if you're talking about hundreds of acres and literally tens of sites. Um, the reason I'm confident sat here, I'm confident sat here because we've got a programme and we've got a team and we've got the partners in place and we've got very good relationships with with boroughs across um, London. I am not for a second saying this is straightforward, not least because it's not within our control. We are dependent upon the boroughs, um, you know, working with them in order to get planning. It's not whether we get planning, it's getting planning and then 
you know, all the other things required to enable us to get on site and doing that at a pace across uh, across London. Um, you know, I think whatever happens, the vast vast majority of sites, the vast majority of homes. But I'm you know I'm not pretending there won't be particular issues on in on individual sites. Is this where you were expected to be when in in 2016? Is this have you bought? Kind um, of schemes forward that you thought you would. Be. I think the scale of opportunity is considerably larger. I've been, you know, impressed at the team that we've been able to assemble and the work that they have done. Uh, for me, there is no question that London will be a better place as a consequence of the work that we've done. And we've obviously. I, I don't deny that, but but uh, and you're working hard to do it. But is this where you expected to be in 2016, or have you had to scale back your aspirations? Um, the targets were that we would bring forward um, 3,000 homes a year this year and last year, and that's what we've done, and we've done so hitting 50% affordable housing. So we are on track. Uh, getting to the point where, um, with two years to go to March 21, we are in a position where we've got the partners in place, and uh, we've then got two years in order to get planning and start on site. Is where I hoped we would be, and that's where we are. So you're not behind schedule. No. Right. Um, so we have a buff. Have you got many questions to go? No, I've got a whole I haven't. section of new I, questions. I really haven't. Um, uh, and you asking me that means I've lost my place. Sorry. In my list. <laughs> no, of course. Uh, oh yeah, here we go. Um, you've obviously set up an organisation to be more professional about for, uh, land holdings, um, and uh, you've, you've decided to do a lot on, on your own of be, and be the, uh, the, 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 the centre of a lot of these um, uh, developments. Do, do you think perhaps you could have done more joint ventures with, with other developers in order to progress? the number of homes you're producing a bit more. Um, let me... Oh, was that? This is clearly a whole section. <laughs> it's it's on another section. Yeah, okay. much. Don't <laughs> answer it. Okay, you'll probably give an answer <laughs> later on. It's good to know finally what one of the questions is in advance. Yeah, it's it's totally the asking you about the different really types of developers you may be working <laughs> with to <laughs> speed things I, up. I, also I your relations that. with boroughs. Yeah, yeah, Thank you, Mr. Evelyn. Yeah, uh, uh, Assembly Member Devlin, you have a specific question. Mine will be a very yes. specific question on the first question. You mentioned that um, you basically said that the boroughs now are your most important partner in terms of getting it through planning. Could I put to you, Graham, that the other big issue is the absorption rate in the market, particularly the residential uh, sales market, dipping somewhat, and perhaps in part of the mix, the retail market again dipping. Are you sure that risk isn't as big a risk that your development partners may come back to you on some of those schemes as the planning process? Um, so I was talking about the single biggest risk. Again, I am not pretending for a second that that is the only risk that we've got. Um, whether it's construction costs, access to uh, labour, um, we will have shortly, within 18 months, two years, 7,000 people employed in construction on these sites. Well, that's what that's that's what we need, um, which is part of the reason why, and again, we we may yet come to this. Uh, we are investing in construction skills training in order to make sure that we have access to the. Um, workload that we need. Um, we've not talked about access to capital. Um, you know, there are a whole variety of risks to anyone that's seeking to build um, thousands of homes across hundreds of acres in London would face, even if those organisations were not undertaking this from a standing start. Um, in terms of um, absorption rates, uh, really this comes to build to rent, and we will cover it in, in more detail. But on the face of it, having mid-market built to rent on the transport network is, you know, the safest residential investment anywhere in London, and part of the reason why that's attractive to us as a number of long-term revenue um, is the fact that that is the single deepest market in London, and we'd be confident about being able to, to develop out at pace and being confident of being able to lease those properties. 
And so the, you know, for us, it's not just starting on sites, and I'm conscious again that that's what the initial target is, but ultimately it's getting these sites built out as fast as we can and getting people in, into those homes. Uh, and with a focus on build to rent, we think that's the fastest way of being able to uh, achieve that. Can I just make a comment on programme? The so build to rent programme? Well, just, just generally. <laughs> I, I just think it's helpful. So w when we say that we've got partners in place by the end of this week, that definitely doesn't mean we're starting from scratch. So typically we will have worked for three to six months with each one of these partners to develop a fairly detailed scheme, something we've evaluated to select them on. And those schemes that we work quite hard to evaluate can be put into play fairly quickly after that. So, you know, there is a process to move forward. Um, our partners are aware of our start and site date. They're fully resourced. Um, we have planning programmes that are submitted as part of these bids. With the, the build to rent programme, we've worked for sort of three, four months with the bidders and they've set out clear programmes for each one of the sites, very detailed programmes for at least 2,000 of those units. So we're, we're kind of ready to go from the end of March rather than just starting afresh with new partners. Okay. Um, so, Graham, can I ask you to predict when the first residents will move into a home built on TfL land? Um, in terms of residents over the course of the next three months or so, so we've got sites um, that are being completed on the uh, A40, um, and uh, you know we'll have in total there's a little over 300 of those, um, and uh, sorry, um, one, 181 of those, um, and yeah, those will be completed, and the people. Um, in, in those homes uh, over the course of the next few months. It's the top line uh, of the yeah. table. Uh, so the first of those are, as it happens, the 46 London affordable rent homes. That's great. So when you say f a few months, that's what, three? Three months from now? Right, great. We'll, we'll come back and hold <laughs> you to that. Um, so final, finally on this section, what's the impact going to be on the cross of the Crossrail delay? Um, are there impacts in terms of access to, to capital? Um, will the fact that the stations aren't being finished stop you from developing over sites, over station sites and things like that? Is, is it going to have a significant effect? Um, not a significant um, effect. We are on track at present, so completely separate from everything that we've discussed, we have a team uh, within the development team uh, led by Ben Tate, who is doing a great job on 12 overstation developments uh, that we are forecasting to generate. £545 million, pounds, um, largely through co um, commercial schemes. Uh, ben is working on those and we are on track of, um, f for those. Um, clearly, again, any construction programme uh, of this scale, there is risk that's attached to it, uh, but notwithstanding some of the well pub, uh, pub, publicised issues in terms of overstation development, that's um, on track. How many homes homes are planned for overstation developments on Crossrail station? For Crossrail overstation, the only what? It's a lot of shops and. I'm um, sorry. It's, it, in central London, it's mainly um, office sites. In terms of Crossrail sites for development, the largest of those is Limo, yeah. Canning Town, yeah. fifteen hundred <coughs> homes, uh, and. Uh, Woolwich, uh, which is also uh, listed here, which uh, from memories of 300 or so, 400. So available already, Mike, because they have to do with the tunnelling rather than finishing things off, is that uh, right? Yes, so yeah. when we're talking about cross-rail ov overstation development, that's the, we usually mean the central London sites, yeah. uh, and those are for offices. Um, there is one residential site at Tottenham Court Road, um, which again is one that has planning uh, and we're in the process <laughs> of a disposal there. Um, and some other schemes have been delayed sort of as a knock-on effect of that. So for example, Camden Town has been put off and I believe there was going to be <coughs> residential planned in there as well. Um, is there much knock-on effects further into the programme by other things being cancelled? Um, <coughs> again, TfL's uh, budgetary challenges are well known. Um, and you know the organisation is working through the implications of that. What I would say is that a robust commercial development strategy that enables us to unlock sites 
by looking at the opportunity for development is only a good thing because not only is it generating net revenues to reinvest in the transport network, there's also the opportunities on specific sites mm -hmm. in order to understand what scale of development at somewhere like Camden might help to bring forward the much needed um, station capac capacity improvement faster than might otherwise be the case. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that's, that has been put off as a result of the Transport for London review um, of its schemes. That one's now in, I can't remember what the word is now, but in the Transport yeah. Committee member. <laughs> What's the word for it? It's, it's it been was, delayed. It's mm. not something, that we are not assuming any sites from Camden Town over station development within our 10,000 homes. So that wasn't already going to come before 2021? It, it wasn't no. one of the ones that we were... Um, focusing on for our 10,000 homes. We continue to work closely um, with the London, ground, uh, London Underground teams in order to understand there and elsewhere how overstation development might enable homes to be built or in the future maybe how, 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 how overstation development might, might help to unlock uh, necessary station capacity improve, improvement. Okay, and in terms of, I mean this is in your wider Thing, not just to do with housing. Have you had any requests for compensation for developers, commercial housing that have been that have had the opening of their schemes delayed by the Crossrail delay? No, um, none that have reached me, and none that I'm aware of. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on to the next question, Assemblymember Cooper. Yes. We'll be asking about boroughs and relationships, mm. memorandum of understanding. Um, you were just talking in answer to Assemblymember Eshelomi's um, question about Landmark House, about um, the business of working with Southwark. Um, obviously, you've just been emphasising the number of boroughs across London where you're um, moving ahead. Um, and I just wondered if you could tell us how many memoranda of understanding have actually now been signed with the different boroughs, 32 boroughs in the city? All 33? Um, no, four or five. Four or five. Um, in general, we... Oh, point, point. Um, so we've got four or five boroughs with whom we have um, memoranda of understanding. I think those are where we've got a particularly large development site or where there's multiple development sites and it's useful for us and for them in order to pull together our interest. That is by no means a necessary step in order to have an effective working relationship uh, with the boroughs. And really, I mean, what, we're sort of focus, what we are focused in on is getting uh, so-called planning performance agreements, PPAs, um, which establishes how we work with the, with the boroughs on, us, um, on, on each site. Um, e either way, formality, structure is what we need, whether in practice a, a memorandum of understanding or a PPA or some other route. We're sort of open really to understanding from the individual borough what works for them. Well, I was going to ask you what are the benefits of the MOUs that you've signed so far, but I'm going to broaden that out and say what are the benefits of the four or five that you've signed so far, mm. and also what are the benefits of the planning performance agreements that you've you, you know that you've entered into so far with boroughs. So, um, memoranda of understanding are of benefit because they provide structure. So, let's pick Merton as an example, uh, London Borough of Merton, and the opportunity to develop Morden. Again, not a site that we're assuming uh, as one of our sites to deliver the first 10,000 10, homes, but there is the opportunity for us and Merton to combine our land in interest and to, in total, potentially bring forward a site that might be, you know, 10, 15, 20 acres. But with that type of scale, you've got the ability not simply to build um, 2,000 plus homes, but to think about what's the future of a London town centre uh, in terms of not just housing, but how people are working, how they're enjoying themselves, connectivity, energy, future of of retail. You know, there's a fantastic opportunity for Getting us to work with Getting rid of the them. A24 racetrack that goes around the Civic Centre. I'm a member for Merton and Wandsworth, so I do know that site reasonably well. Getting rid of the very large bus stand outside 
more than underground statement. I mean, at the moment, the delight of that particular town centre is if you've crossed the road and didn't get killed, generally speaking, because um, it's pretty gruesome. So I think that sounds that good in good. the wider perspective. But is that the only benefit then, just having that structure? Or you're also saying that the benefit includes the ability to pool what you're doing and create more housing? So in that case, we're pooling our land together on that site. More broadly, you know, we continue to look to explore opportunities where we, TFL, can sit down and understand with a borough what are its objectives, how might we work together, where there might be opportunity for us to pool land, swap land, marriage value. I mean, ultimately, we want to bring forward the best that we can. We cannot do that in isolation in terms of our land. Our land, although it's extensive across London, individual sites are often smaller than people might imagine, and it's only by looking at our land as the gateway to a larger opportunity that in particular brings in other land held in the public sector. It's only really then, I think, that we, we can deliver the proper benefits that we all want to see, not simply in terms of um, numbers of homes, but proper placemaking that reflect how London needs to evolve in the future. I think that does re uh, require us, and the relationship that we have with the boroughs is absolutely instrumental to that. As I say, MOUs... So will you be entering into more MOUs, do you think, than the four or five that you've got at the moment? I mean, you're talking about the benefits there, and I'm just wondering um, you know, why you haven't entered into more already, because you know, you've been going down this track since... Um, well, let's say June 2016, it's probably slightly unfair to say May 2016, um, so we're almost three years on from the, the last election. Will there be more that you're going to enter into to, to enhance that placemaking and leverage you know, working together in that way? I would differentiate between a memorandum of understanding as a formal legal doc, doc, document and a relationship with the boroughs. Um, so we've got MOUs, see it in front of me now, Merton, Harrow, Barnet and Hounslow. Yeah, I think we have, unless Claire tells me other ways, a positive working relationship with Waltham Forest. We don't need to have, Claire in that particular case, <laughs> a memorandum of un understanding. This is about... We don't have one with Waltham Forest. We don't, right. but I don't think we need one. If we think that will help, then we'll sign one. Right. But this is much more about having a positive working relationship and the formality or structure around that. We're open as much as anything to what the boroughs find to be successful. This will not work if we try and impose one single answer on the boroughs across London. They've got their, their ways of working, and what we need to do across 20 different boroughs is understand what works best for them. Well, let's pull in Claire, if we don't mind at that moment, um, or Councillor Coghill, depending on which you prefer. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, we're just exploring there whether an MOU is needed in each case. Um, and Graham's clearly saying not necessarily, mm -hmm. and that's the situation with the London Borough of Waltham Forest. Um, so how's it going in terms of the working relationship with TfL? Are those benefits of placemaking and improving centres, pooling land, all of the elements that we were just exploring? How's that working in Waltham Forest? Um, extremely well. Um, we don't need an MOU because TfL have from the start and at every level in the organisation, not just at the senior level but absolutely every level, been open, engaging, straightforward, transparent and have sought to get to know us as an authority, sought to go and visit sites and come and see community activity that they didn't really need to do. Uh, but they wanted to get under the skin of the area to be, as I, as I could see it, far more effective partners and also better engaged with the community to be able to get through the type of scheme and the scale of scheme that we want to see really <laughs> delivering across London. Um, the example that I'll give, uh, if I may, Chair, would be Black Horse Road, which is brilliantly confusing because there's a station called Black Horse Road that sits between Black Horse Road and Black Horse Lane. So the area ripe for development, and a lot of development has already come forward there, is Black Horse Lane and TfL have a site there. Um, there was obviously an opportunity because we'd, we looked at our plans, we were prepared to be more ambitious in terms of height and scale, uh, and I think we'd been uh, far too timid previously, and we wanted to be more ambitious. We got the 24-hour tube at the weekend that's coming through. We've got Walthamstow Wetlands opening, which is 500 acres of green open space. This incredible opportunity. 
and we had a programme of saying we need to make sure that we've got the right mix of, um, we had a brand new secondary school built that the council had paid for, uh, major investment through Mini Holland for cycling infrastructure, um, we'd got hundreds of homes coming forward, we'd got new community provision and there was this appetite from us to make sure that we were maximising that. It's very close by to, uh, to another housing zone as it happens in Harringay and you start to bring all of that together and you see the, the great potential. TfL arrived at the right moment to have a brilliant conversation and said right how can we help? We have this site, we have this car park site and the opportunity of that is tremendous. You know, the idea that you've got a fantastic public transport network and you are TfL and you're going to sit on a car park, well, that didn't seem something that they were keen to do. And it's completely contrary to everything we're looking to do in terms of the environment in our borough. Um, and so the, the conversation started. I think there was real care and attention shown to that relationship but also making sure that when a development partner had been selected by TfL, I was invited to come in to have a pre-meet, was then introduced to the people from Barrett who'd been selected as a There's partner. There's been a so lot of partnership, real work. partnership yeah. working going on, but not necessarily felt the need to enshrine it into a formal MOU. What, exactly, yeah. exactly, because it'll just slow it down, let's crack on. And what about yeah. the planning performance agreement? Has that been something that you've been looking at in Morgan Forest? So as? planning performance is something that I take personally very, very seriously. I had the regeneration portfolio for three years and there were various things that councils do across this country that are pretty ludicrous, including I inherited a situation where we didn't have planning committees in, in August. All right, okay, why? You know, I don't know any other bit of government that, well, probably there are some centrally, I'm sure we can all agree on that. Uh, but this, you know, we have, why are we, why are we waiting? Why are we uh, pausing at these key strategic moments? There is a desire to see homes built in London in boroughs like mine. Why would we, why would we hinder that? So, I keep a close eye on you know, the progress and uh, I think we've got a pretty sleek operation as they go but I also understand that people understand that my chief exec stores open, my cabinet members stores open and my doors open if they're hitting unnecessary brick walls. So there's also not a joint venture, I mean um, Assemblymember Boff was just referring to the idea of doing a joint venture or a, a, a joint land company or anything like that, you haven't gone down that road. So basically in that sort of sense you're looking at something that might be quite varied across each borough, it's just going to be what's most effective? Exactly, yes. And so we've got multiple different types, types multiple opportunities with multiple partners uh, and there is a huge amount of work that has to go in but there is not one answer and we would never achieve the overall targets if we try to impose a single answer across London. I mean I think that's very exciting to hear about the very positive relationship that you're having with um, Waltham Forest. Can you just say, because I know also that you have your role in London councils, um, is there anyone that needs a bit of a chivvying up in, uh, amongst your uh, fellow oh, I can't, I can't uh, London councils? Like so no, I okay. I do, I do think that's I thought about that. <laughs> but it, it, is, it is a very, very important point, elegantly put, if I may say, um, because this is, this is really it. There are boroughs we can't get where well, you can't get stuff done, you know. And those, uh, the leaders of those authorities, with small L, um, have a deep responsibility to actually deliver homes, um, even if there aren't the uh, affordable units, the percentage of affordable units that you would like, that you would always push for. Um, you know, fifty percent of nothing is nothing. You've got to have stuff happening, and you've got to be able to signal two partners, whether they be private sector or public sector partners, that there is will, that you're not a pushover as an authority by any means, that you will be, uh, that you will be resilient if people come forward with NAF schemes that won't deliver what you want and what our residents demand, but that ultimately London is a place that needs to grow and we're doing, we're doing all, all that we can. And from our perspective, I mean, several of us here around the table either have been councillors, <laughs> Assemblymember Boff and Assemblymember Eshalomi, uh, the rest of us actually all are councillors. <laughs> so whilst we understand the, those weird lines on the map, the edges of boroughs, mm -hmm. we also know that, you know, people place families, you know, who are homeless anywhere, not necessarily mm -hmm. within the, the borough boundaries. Yeah, and yeah. so that's why I asked that question about other um, boroughs other than yourself, because mm -hmm. I, we do see this obviously as a, mm -hmm. a housing need that needs to be met across mm -hmm. the 
the whole of London. Mm. Now, we've moved from talking about uh, the positive relationships with the local authorities, and perhaps some need to get more of a wriggle on, okay. to uh, possibly not my favourite people to try and work with, because I've always found them incredibly difficult, Network Rail. Um, you might find them an absolute pleasure and a delight, and very fast to answer everything. Um, how are you finding Network Rail to work with from the TfL perspective, um, particularly in terms of land assembly? I mean, there's plenty of places where TfL and, and Network Rail are clearly uh, very closely aligned, let's just say that. Um, we have 250 adjoining interests with Network Rail. Um, they own 50% um, more land in London than we do. Um, uh, we have, uh, you know, part of two of our initial sites, both at Kidbrook, um, where we've submitted planning for 619 homes, 50% affordable, and at um, Landmark Court in Southwark Street. In both those cases, there was a <coughs> network rail interface. Uh, we have, in both of those cases, managed through the interface and got to the point where we can bring those sites forward. I think something that I would be keen on moving forward is to be at a point where we can agree a broader relationship with network rail um you know i think at the moment it works well but at a sort of trans transactional site by site level i think understanding more broadly um how we could bring forward the sites that we have i think that's a uh, uh, something that we'd be keen to see us do do more work on particularly given the numbers of adjoining sites that we have at a personal level, we get on well with them. We work with them. I think um, you know it's. Uh, I, I think there is more that we can do jointly with them in order to bring forward more sites. Well, yes, you just mentioned two sites, but then you started by talking about 250. I'm not going to ask you to go through what you're doing on the other 248 because that would clearly take too long. But I don't know whether there is anything else that you can tell us, perhaps by um, corresponding with us after the meeting, about some of the other sites. But it would be good to have a feel for how effectively the relationship is developing because uh, I certainly have experienced difficulties with um, getting network rail kind of onto the page of having a sense of urgency about, you know, this is an area, it's obviously not their main um, function, um, just as, you know, obviously it's not TfL's main function, so getting a sense of urgency there I think is quite important. Um, I just wanted to ask also about government funding, the one public estate, housing infrastructure funds, um, is that something that you're going to be making extensive use of or as much use of as possible? Um, as much as possible, so one public estate we've um had uh, success in funding both at Morden and Fenwick. Uh, I think more broadly, um, the Housing Infrastructure Fund, um, we were successful, we TfL were successful in an application uh, for the DLR um, that is providing you know, additional trains and expanded depot and ultimately helps to unlock a significant development site that we have uh, above popular DLR DLR depot. Um, I think in the to-do category is understanding how we might work better with central government in terms of you know, we are often successful where we bid for sites but at the moment we are bidding on an individual site by site basis against uh, other cities. I think given the scale of development opportunity that we have in London uh, given the significant expertise that we've developed within the team that we have, understanding what a broader relationship might look like with some of those government departments and how we might jointly be working on bringing sites forward as a portfolio rather than on a site-by-site -site basis is something that I would be keen to explore further. Well, I was going to ask you what more could the Mayor of Central Government be doing to improve the collaborative release of public lands for homes, but you clearly stated that obviously bringing things forward, I think, as a portfolio of sites rather than on a site-by-site -site basis would be a step forward. Is there anything else that you'd like either the Mayor or Central Government to do, if you had your one wish? Um, just, just the one, mind. <laughs> just one. I think we... If I was picking one thing, it would be more transparency on on, on ownership across the city. Um, you know, it's just being in a position to understand who owns what, so that as easily as possible we, we we could understand where the opportunities might be 
in order to partner with others. I have talked about, you know, but we go through an extensive exercise seeking to understand how we prioritise our sites. If we were in a position to straightforwardly understand who owns adjoining interests, that might then help to shape uh, the order in which we bring sites forward. Okay. On, on a different area, um, public consultation, when um, sites are coming forward, um, obviously, again, that's not a sort of central role of Transport for London, but if you're developing sites, it's clearly something that has to be done. Um, do, you, do you have more confidence that going forward that you're going to be able to manage processes of consultation as effectively as possible. I think it's really important that we take people with us. I mean, um, Claire was just talking about all the different developments in Waltham Forest. The Mini Holland was quite controversial when it first went in, mm. but it's about having that confidence and working mm. with people. And I think it's the same with housing developments, isn't it? When something new is being suggested, particularly for TfL, you have to take people with you. Is that something you can manage better, I think is the word? Um. I touched on it earlier, this is the single biggest challenge that we've got. Um, we've held over 23 COD consultation events in the course of the last six months. Um, we've had 2,000 people in to those events uh, and the main you know, wave of activity is yet to start. Uh, at Black Horse Road um, we met with 33 stake, stakeholder groups. Um, you know, cycling groups, schools, landowners, businesses, there is no shortcutting this. You have to put an extraordinary amount of effort into every site. And if you're doing this across <coughs> literally dozens of sites across London, it, no avoiding the fact this is a major, major exercise. Um, and it, but it's not just about hitting a programme, important though that is. We take very seriously the responsibility of the development pipeline that we're managing we have to get it right in taking local people with us um, getting local people's involvement engaging in engagement making sure that we bring the best development that we can much as we're saying about memorandums of understanding you know there isn't one answer to how we work with boroughs there certainly isn't one answer to how we bring forward sites London is a whole variety of individual villages and towns and cities and crucial to our success is our ability to understand at a local level what is the right answer. And you cannot do that sat in to TfL's offices. You have to spend an extraordinary amount of time out and about understanding locally what's the right answer. Uh, I think we have started well, um, but I don't for a moment pretend that it's anything other than a significant un undertaking. I just wonder if I could ask Liana to comment on um, consultation processes and with particular reference obviously to the Community Land Trust. Yeah. Yes, talking to people around the sites we're working on in Lambeth and in Shadwell, there is a real sense of anger about people seeing their neighbourhoods change around them, luxury flats going up, shiny tower blocks and feeling that they have little or no say in those changes. And um, part of that anger comes from Alice in Wonderland definitions of what is affordable. But part of it is that there hasn't been any meaningful consultation. Um, one of the people who got involved in our Lambeth steering group did so because his estate had just is being regenerated and the first thing he knew about it was the football field being cordoned off for building that there hadn't been any real outreach to residents there. And so it's, it's hardly surprising that lots of developments, even ones that include affordable housing, are being blocked in the planning process. And, and we know that when people are part of the decision making about the design of buildings, about the allocation of buildings, then they're much, much more likely to back those developments when they come to planning. In um, our first community land trust in St Clement's in Mile End, that site, there'd been proposals to develop it two or three times before, and those had always been blocked at development. But when we brought forward our development plans alongside the, the developer, and not only did that go through without a single objection, which was unheard of in that densely populated part of Tower Hamlets, but in fact residents were asking, could there be an extra story to provide more affordable housing? And, and I actually think that TfL is in a good place to take forward um, real and meaningful, not just consultation, but 
but to some extent uh, involvement and co-production because in other sections of TFL I've worked with, um, with some of your planning involving disabled passengers, you've got IDAG, you've got a youth panel, there's, there's really good practice going on on involving people in decision making at an early stage. So if that, some of that practice was brought forward to the housing part of it, I think that there could be a great deal done to minimise the risk of housing being blocked at planning. Or people having that sense of alienation. I think that's really encouraging to hear um, how much time and effort you have, I now understand that you need to put into this to make something land in an area where people understand it and appreciate it and want it, rather than landing in an area and people feeling like someone just, you know, a spaceship has landed from, from Mars. I think, that, I think that's some really interesting points that have just been made. But you also did make the point about um, Alice in Wonderland affordability. Uh, and of course, that has been such a struggle for us here in, in London in terms of the percentage of affordable. And we just explored that around uh, Landmark Court 8, I think, flats we, we came to in the end. Um, and I think that's really important for people as well, because they do go and look on, you know, uh, online um, at property move sites and they see that you know all the flats in the development are six hundred thousand pounds which is not three times most people's salaries in london um so you know you're, you're also in a uniquely uh, interesting and fantastic position actually to have a really high percentage of properly affordable um in terms of many locations i would hope could you give us some examples of where you are definitely hitting that 50 percent target um you just mentioned kidbrook Yes, uh, we're hitting 50% as an average across London. Um, as I say, we tend to, looking across the portfolio, um, uh, the lowest we have will tend to be 35%, maybe 40%, the highest 100%. Um, we both seek to deliver the portfolio, you know, the 50% average across the portfolio. We also clearly need to work with the individual boroughs to understand what their aspirations are, uh, both on a site-by-site -site basis in terms of the proportion of affordable housing, but also the mix within that percentage. So again, Harrow on the Hill is an example where we've got uh, development, Harrow on the Hill Town Centre with Redrow, which is 35% affordable housing. Um, we have brought to market, we'll announce next week, our partner for Rainers Lane, Stanmore and Cannons Park, and we're bringing forward those sites at 100% affordable housing. So um, you know, we are achieving the 50%. Uh, we, in the sites we brought to market this year, I think we'll definitely exceed 50%, and I am confident we can uh, achieve it. Um, yeah, again, an awful lot of work goes into uh, the modelling that we do, but really it's only when we sit down and have the conversations with the borough that we can understand what their aspirations are, and ultimately we need to reach agreement on every one of dozens of sites. But obviously there must be, um, you were just exploring the sort of, you've got the stretching financial targets as well, there must be a temptation um, in the inner London boroughs, because there we were just talking about outer London boroughs, and obviously that's where Wolf and Forest is as well, but places like Southwark and Lambeth where land values are higher, to go for um, either shared ownership, outright sale, office, and just reduce the, the reduce the percentage just to create the income to meet your financial targets as well. You say you're balancing it across all of the sites, but I'm just concerned that there's definitely going to be affordable housing that's being created in inner London and it's not all going to be pushed into the outer London areas. Least we will ever have is I think 35% affordable housing. Um, we generally, the, the boroughs, we, we have a good relationship with the boroughs, we understand what their require, require, uh, requirements are and if there's a need or if there's a strong desire from the borough for affordable housing on a particular site then we of course will work with them in order to <coughs> achieve that. This would not work again if we were coming up with a spreadsheet and 
seeking to dictate to individual boroughs where we think the affordable housing should be in order to help us achieve our financial numbers. That wouldn't work. Sorry, no, I don't it, think that would. <laughs> it, it wouldn't work. But I think it's, it's also the case that we cannot look at affordable housing as being a kind of tariff that we have to hit. We, we've got the best portfolio in London. We want to make the best of it that we can. London has a problem with affordable housing. London has a problem with uh, affordable workspace. London needs <laughs> cultural space. It needs light in, in, in industrial space. We've got a fantastic portfolio and we honestly want to do the best that we can with it. This isn't something that we want to try and game as a system. This is something where we're actually trying to consciously meet the challenges that London faces. And we try and do that as best as we can across our portfolio, but we only get to the right answer if we're working closely with the boroughs and closely with the local people across the capital. I think the way this conversation that we've been having with this committee um, over the last three years uh, and with yourself and building up the team within TfL is now in a very different place from the first time we asked you the questions. And it's obvious, I think, that you have developed your thinking to a huge extent around this whole area. Um, and you've also built up expertise in-house as well. Are you going to leverage the use of those staff? Because obviously, in some ways, local authorities who have been in a very difficult position and have not been doing as much development over the last 10 years. Actually, in the past, there probably were times when there were public bodies who were doing as much development as you're talking about now, but it was now some time in the past. Are you going to do any sort of sharing in terms of that expertise with local authorities or potentially others um, to, to make sure that the public developments do move ahead at a speed? That's something you're going to look to? Um, it's something that we are doing and increasingly we are doing. I think Dan met the NHS yeah, we recently. Met, yeah, absolutely. We met the NHS to try and. I'm sorry, you've just the last one. Yeah. Uh, so um, we, we have targets, we've got ambitious targets, we're not going to threaten our, our ability to hit those targets by seeking to develop you know, land that's not ours, but if, if there is lessons that we can share, if there's uh, existing procurements that other people can take advantage of, if there's anything that we can do to help others um, uh, within London or indeed elsewhere, safely assume, again, we've got significant expertise and if there's things that we can do to help others bring forward, particularly land in London, we are willing to do anything that we can in order to help that to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Apologies to rush you through that. We are, we are getting some very interesting questions now that we're very short of time. <coughs> I just wanted to note that in terms of overall affordable housing numbers, um, the table you provided with us, there's a very clear distinction between things that were developed pre-2016 and things that were developed afterwards. Um, there's an awful lot of central London prime sites at 0% affordable housing in the previous set of schemes. Um, the newer schemes that are coming forwards, like you say, they are mainly at 35% affordable, um, and some of them are at 100%, including the, the Black Horse Road. No, that's 50% 50, that's 50 affordable, isn't it? 50%, yeah. And of those affordable homes, we're getting most of them at London affordable rent, which is close to social rent levels, as opposed to pretend affordable. Mm -hmm. Is that something you fought for, Councillor um, Cockhill, or is that something TfL volunteered to do? Um, the, we have been very, very clear that that's what our expectation is, and TfL arrived as part of the wider conversation with us already setting that out. Um, I, th there is a lot we can do politically as elected members um, to signal that this is our aspiration and this is what we want. And this is what our communities need, this is what our communities desperately need, as you, would, as you were describing. Um, the reality is that the law doesn't back us. So if you were to not have that constructive conversation with any partner, frankly, TfL or any other developer, um, and it were to go to a committee and be turned down, well, you may very well have that decision overturned at uh, planning appeal by the planning inspectorate. So I think there's, a, there's obviously a massive ambition that we have as a council and that I have personally as a leader, but that needs to be tempered uh, with a degree of rationalism. 
uh, when you're dealing with certain partners, uh, particularly the more uh, the more hungry and aggressive ones. TfL are great to work with and, and have been because they share that ambition, um, and it's very clear the direction that Sadiq's given. You know, this this ambition is to be shared. This ambition and responsibility to deliver it should be shared as well, and I think that's I think that's gone well. Um, would I like more grant from central government to go further? Yeah, absolutely. Would I like more grant for these guys so that they don't have to uh, do what they have to do with their portfolio of land? Yeah, absolutely. But that unfortunately isn't the position we're in. Great, thank you. And, and Graham, um, do you have? Because we've asked for the first time in your table of information for the, the tenure splits to come. So it's not just the percent of affordable, which can be quite a blunt instrument. Um, we've asked for the, the different types of affordable to be split out. Yes. Um, so we've got you know, London living rent, London affordable rent, shared ownership, real social rent, discount market rent, all of those different things are split out. Um, obviously, social rent and London affordable rent are the ones that we really, really need in terms of the London plan. Do you have an internal target for what percentage, what proportion of your affordable homes are to be at those social levels of rent? Not a specific target. My expectation would be it would be probably a third. Okay, because we've, we've done our sums um, on this bit and we've, we've worked out that 32% of what's been coming forwards is at those kinds of rates. Sounds about right. Of the affordable, that is, yeah. not of the homes overall. Of the homes overall, it's only about 8%, which obviously is still way below what we'd like. But yeah, okay, thank you. Um, we're moving on to builds to rent now, and there'll be more questions about affordable housing within that. There will, yes. <laughs> thank you, Chair. Um, well, my question was in two parts. The first part is which sites... Uh, which sites are you offering for build to rent? The second part was who are your partners going to be? But I think based on the conversation we're having earlier, you won't be able to tell us that just yet. But wh wh which sites are you are you moving forward with uh, with build to rent? I'll just cover that one, down. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we put forward a squad of ten sites initially as part of our kind of marketing campaign for for build to rent. Um, over that period, um, we have. Selected um, Southall, Nine Elms, Woolwich, Canning Town, um, Cockfosters, Montford Place as the sites that we will most likely take forward as built to rent. Mm. Um, there are a couple of sites that are in the initial information that have fallen out for a variety of reasons, some to do with size, some to do with uh, competition in the area for built to rent. Wouldn't be sort of a sensible decision to, to develop built to rent in, in some of the areas. So, it, as we stand here, about to appoint the partner on Monday, um, seven of those sites will come forward as built to rent. Mm. Uh, we've worked through detailed plans for the delivery of those sites with the three partners um, from a planning perspective and also from a resource perspective. So we can literally start on Monday or Tuesday um, working collaboratively with those partners. And it's, it's worth saying that we've stressed throughout the process that we will work collaborative as part of that sort of development management function so we're not passive part of this we're actually in there offering our sort of skills and abilities to bring sites forward which is infused with the partners build to rent dna and um i just want to clarify something this sort of goes back slightly to to the the non build to rent stuff but yeah. uh, obviously with build to rent and i've seen the, the structure in your your very impressive glossy um Glossy brochure, which yeah. uh, I think we've got, I've got somewhere, which you gave us yeah, one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, very nice. Um, uh, and you know, you'll be, this land will be held in joint ventures. Can I just clarify where where you're not doing build to rent? Because my understanding was TfL wasn't disposing any freeholds. Is is the freehold still being kept, and you're selling leaseholds? Yeah. Is that, the, that that is the structure with. with yeah, that, yeah. I mean, typically that, that's just what we do as custodians. We retain the freehold and sell on the leasehold interest. Can you speak up a tiny bit? Um, <laughs> And in terms of meeting your targets, because um, we understand that the build to rent can be brought forward more um, more quickly than homes for sale, yeah. how important has that been in terms of hitting your hitting your target? Um, I, I, th I think it's pretty important. I mean, we made a decision in 2018 to just diversify our offer and our delivery routes. Um, I think the I mean that makes complete sense to me. It's very logical. Um, the market for build to rent is incredibly strong, the mm. funding for build to rent is incredibly strong, the demand for the rental product is incredibly strong, so it's 
it's deliverable through all markets. So in terms of our portfolio, it is an you know, incredibly important part now. Um, it allows us to retain long-term ownership around our stations, provide a great sort of rental experience for people using the accommodation and also for us to generate a long-term revenue. Has part of that been, because I know that in London we, we have been seeing house prices coming down, values coming down, has that been part of your, your decision because rents have remained remaining quite high, well, rent, rents are continuing yeah, to no, rise? I, I, see your, I see your point. I mean, I don't... Was it a consideration? I think it's just it's just logical that it, you don't want to be reliant on one particular yeah. sector, regardless. So there will be ebbs and flows in the private for sale market, which you know may be happening now. But the reality is that bills to rent is a useful foil in all markets. So why not use that to de-risk the delivery of part of the portfolio? Sorry, it's also worth saying that if you were taking a five-year view, it's still the case that you would sell. You know, the big change here is taking that long-term mm. view. We could and should be taking a 30-year view. And if you take a 30-year view, then you hold on, you create the long-term asset that generates long-term revenue, notwithstanding some changes in house, in, in house prices. If you were just looking at it short-term, you would just sell. But for us, that's not the right answer. Well, you've answered the second part of my next question then, which was... Are you uh, are these for long term, or will you be disposing them after fifteen years or whatever it is in the, in the London plan? You're allowed to, yeah, so, to move them on. So, so this is a long term. That's investment. an easy one. Yeah. So we are designing specific build to rent products. So if if you become a, a customer in one of our build to rent developments, you've got complete security of tenure for the next um, thirty years because that that's what's going to happen. It's going to be a, a rental development. And what are the key factors in determining whether you go build to rent or private or, or for sale? Um, well, typically, um, well, let's, the, the main factor is location. Mm-hmm. So the transport nodes are fantastic locations for rental demand. We typically look at the area, do the analysis on the sort of um, social area and the demand. But uh, built to rent is, it has to be near rent, um, transport nodes. Um, so that's kind of the main determining factor we went through. Given the success of the work that Dan has led, I think it's fair to say that build to rent is now the initial option that we will look at. If we can't make it work for build to rent, then we'll look at other options, but the starting point of default will be, can we make it work for build to rent? And coming to the issue of affordability, now I know in your... In yeah. your um, Prospectus, you, you talk about uh, um, uh, expect expectation that forty um, percent uh, will be affordable. That strikes me as odd um, when the mayor's own target for public land or the threshold for public land is is fifty percent, and I believe that is going to apply to build to rent as, as well as for sale now. So I'm wondering why there is this dis- discrepancy with. What the mayor's expecting in the London plan on one side, and given Graham what you were saying earlier about being compliant with the new London plan and having this lower expectation. Um, there is also a section in the London plan that um, uh, public authorities can take a portfolio wide view, and that's what we're doing here. So, uh, as I said, we, the generally the lowest we'll do is 35 to 40 percent. Uh, in terms of making an assumption, we've made an assumption in build to rent that the average across the portfolio will be 40%. Clearly, across the piece, um, we still need to deliver and will deliver the average of 50% affordable housing. That therefore will mean that if we're delivering less than 50% through build to rent, then we'll have to deliver more than 50% as an average across the piece. And what led you to what? 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 What that has led you to conclude that you need to go with a lower rate for build to rent than, than perhaps with other uh, perhaps with a, a, other types of development. Um, it was an assumption that we had to make at a point in time. I think fifty percent as an average. Generally, there, there are there are developers, there are sites. Um, and you know, there are sites that work well at 35, 40% affordable housing. There's other sites that work well at 75, 80 or 100% or mm. af- affordable housing. It's much easier to bring forward at scale uh, a, a portfolio that delivers an average of 50% than it is to try and bring forward every single site forward at 50%. We will exceed 50% this year. 
I think where we can deliver more than 50%, then we will do so. The 40% was um, an assumption that we made at the point when we said we'd bring um, build to rent to market. We have yet to have any discussions, meaningful discussions, with our partner in individual individual boroughs. So I, you know, I wouldn't read it too much into what we've said at this point. It was an assumption that we made. Okay, it it just seems it just seems a bit strange. It's slightly incongruous with what the mayor is expecting elsewhere, notwithstanding what you say about about the London plan saying you can have. Uh, uh, have it as an average across your portfolio, um, and whether or not I was wondering whether or not is it is it mainly to do with the specific sites in question, or is it something to do with the build to rent model in in general that perhaps you think it supports a lower level of affordable? No, um, no, no, nothing to do with with that at all. It was just part of the portfolio strategy that we took as Graham says, which um, you, you can do under the draft London plan. Uh, and drilling down um, into the um, into that uh, percentage of affordable, in terms of um, in terms of a ten year blend, um, what sort of expectations have you got about that ability? Are you going to be um, delivering? Do you expect at uh, London affordable rent, or are we going to be seeing uh, properties delivered that are? 80% of market rent, which of course the mayor has himself said he doesn't consider to be affordable. So we're definitely not going to be delivering 80% of market rent. <coughs> um, we, we've been through a, a, a tender process and I can't talk about it in too much detail, but as part of that we've made it very clear to the partners that the affordable housing needs to be affordable and not at those sorts of levels. So on our larger sites I think we can deliver a wide range of tenures, including London affordable rent. Um, on the site of three, four hundred units, we'd be looking to deliver discount market rent, um, thirty percent of which would be London living rent, and seventy percent would be negotiated and discussed with the individual boroughs. Now we've not had those conversations yet, but we would look to do those as soon to have those as soon as we have a, a partner in place. But um, we're finding that those discussions are very much site by site and have to be taken um, with the individual boroughs. To me, that does suggest that there is a risk of us creeping into these higher, that this this higher sort of percentage of market rents, which the mayor has said he wants to rule out. And again, that seems to go against the sort of direction of travel we're having here at the GLA in terms of affordable yeah. tenures. So I guess what I'm asking is, what sort yeah. of guarantees have we got that we're not going to be, you know, getting up to 70, 80 percent? Because I think London living rent's about 60 percent on on average. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so so our assumptions have been for the for the bidding process around about sixty five percent as a blended average, and as I say, discussions will go on with the the individual boroughs to work out what the tenure mix are. But we're certainly not in the world of eighty percent of discount market rent. I mean, I can absolutely okay. confirm that if if that's not clear enough, then that it should be. Okay. Um. Can we? Can I interrupt at this point, Tom? Yes, and ask you about can. the Apartments for London deal that's been done separately to what's going, going forward with yeah, the, yeah, okay, the okay. separate procurement yeah, service. Yeah. Obviously, the, the thing you're working on, Daniel, is these yes. nine sites that are in the nice brochure. I love the brochure, um, yeah. <laughs> so they're the ones that are being offered up for the future. Yeah. Um, separately, there's been um, a partnership with something called Apartments for London, which, as I understand it, that's doing... Um, discount market rate at 20% below market rates, which said the dreaded 80% yeah, affordable. Um, these are on the table as being schemes that are 100% affordable. Um, and we'd probably quibble with that mm. definition. <laughs> we might say 0% affordable. Yeah. Um, so what's what's going on with that? This is a deal that was done under the previous mayor or recently? or um, And will, that, will we see more of that? And is it really 20% off instead of more? Um. We have had discussions with apartments for London. Um, we part of what we try and do is work with innovative companies, sometimes small companies, um, in order to see what we might do in order to unlock uh, sites that otherwise we might struggle to bring forward. Um, with apartments for London, I think that it is. A, 
there is a potential for a deal with them, but probably at no more than a very small number of sites and small in this context, maybe as small as one. Um, we are having conversations with them. We and they are having conversations with the borough. It's a little too soon, I think, to say actually what's the number of homes that might come forward and the tenure mix of those homes. It, it, I'm not pretending it's straightforward. It's a continual challenge to seek to understand with whom we might work in order to bring forward in individual sites that work for that sites, but also helps us to, 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 to deliver what we need across the piece. Okay, that's really useful. I think, yeah, the, the, the business model that, we've, that yeah. we're going to discuss yeah. is one where there's a range of different tenures, some Absolutely. of which are full and some of which... And Absolutely. actually, if we were thinking about what we might want, Absolutely. 100% of not really affordable to anyone is not much use, whereas a little yeah, yeah. bit of private plus some yeah. social would be more of a... I, I, mean, the, 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 I think we'll deliver at different levels mm. um, on that sort of spectrum. But not, 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 not all the way up to necessarily that. Absolutely. Yeah. Like whatever I hear, because it's, it's just... It's... It's because the term affordable is now, as we were discussing sort of earlier, has become so stretched. Every time I hear sort of things like discount market rent yeah, or yeah, affordable yeah. rent, yeah. other than London affordable yeah. rent, yeah. I get very concerned and sort of yeah. blended, um, with blended, blended rates. Blended yeah. rates. Yeah, I, I get very very worried, and, yeah. and and people start to get very suspicious yeah. about exactly what that entails. It will of course be easier for us to report on what it is that we have agreed on a site by site basis and what that means across the portfolio. It's obviously much harder yeah. sat here when we're talking about 25 different partners in place across 51 sites, 320 acres to try and forecast pre often discussions with the boroughs as to where we might end, end up but I'm expecting a series of discussions in the months and years ahead as we have to re report back and attend the committee and explain the mix that we c that we c come to. The, the other thing of course as well in terms of the locations of where the affordable homes are so I mean going back to the point assembly member Cooper was making earlier and this example is in her constituency the Nine, Nine Elms uh, um, development where you've got 25% uh, affordable but um, it is all shared ownership, and that's already on a on a scheme um, uh, where you've got next to Battersea Power Station, which is very very low levels of affordable, no social, and no, there's no affordable, no housing. affordable. I mean, that's what people locally yeah. because nobody can afford six hundred thousand pounds as a first time buyer. There you go. So so I mean, and it comes up to the point about the geography of where we're locating um, where we're locating affordable housing, and couldn't TfL be putting some London affordable rent social housing within the Nine Elms development uh, uh, to try and mitigate against some of you know what's what's happened there already? Talk through. Yeah, I mean we, we've obviously got an existing consent there which was secured pre pre May sixteen. Um, I think Nine Elms is one of the sites where we'll be we'll be looking at quite closely for build to rent um, and. It may present us some opportunities to possibly increase density in that location and to um, improve that affordable housing offer. But that's something that we, you know, cognizant that we we need to work through with the partner over the next few months. But I can completely take the point. But that is a, you know, it's, it's a planning application we've almost inherited in that sense. And just moving us on on from affordable to. Um, so the question of what will distinguish a TfL um, build to rent uh, scheme from a housing association or private sector and thinking of things like, you know, distinctiveness in terms of branding and things like that. Are we going to have, um, are we going to have sort of roundels and the brickwork and, I don't know, moquette, I don't know, taste, moquette <laughs> carpet all, in the hallway. We don't be quite keen on renting uh, class. <laughs> <like that. laughs> but but is, is there going to be no, a kind is, of yeah. specific kind of feel in terms of the quality, in terms of the design and things like that that's going to distinguish it from other yeah. so I think we can definitely come back and talk about this a little bit more um, mm. when we've selected the partner but we're, we're quite excited about this um, because we, we really want to leave a, a sort of a lasting legacy on these developments yeah. um, design is one thing and we've come forward with our own design charter so we've tried to lead that discussion with developers which I think we might have provided you with previously mm. and if not we can anyway so that's really really important to us and uh, we've had lots of meetings on design and the importance of that. Um, may see the round at a station near you, who knows. <laughs> the other side of it is the, is the management piece. So we, again, we've been quite proactive. We've come forward with how 
Um, we'd like to see these developments managed so longer tenancies, clarity around rent reviews, security of tenure, mm. good level of service. So we've tr these sort of really important touch points, we've tried to um, really lead the conversation in that way. So hopefully that's what you'll see with the TFL development. And I think that point about longer tenures is again, this comes back to making sure this is not incongruous with what the mayor is doing elsewhere. And of course the mayor is coming up with a, I think he's got his commission Karen Buck to, to lead a, a group that's coming up with a private rented charter. And Absolutely. if TFL's builds or properties weren't offering at least what that was what that comes up with I think yeah. there would be an issue there certainly politically for, yeah for quite the I mean our, our document that we provided sets out very clearly on on day one some of the management principles that are probably mm. going to come from or, or um, be used in that work which are taken from the London plan and that you know it's really important to us actually that we give people that security of tenure in our developments my expectation is that we'll become the largest landlord for build to rent in London um, and I think you know we have high aspirations for what we do and we would be keen to be involved in the shaping of the product um, you know we of course want to work with it but to be involved in actually shaping it having TFL build to rent uh, as a pioneer for what high quality build to rent looks like from a design um, security of tenure sustain sustainability point of view why wouldn't we want to do the absolute best that we can with this fantastic opportunity absolutely well that's good to hear and, and just finally it's a question um uh, about off-site manufacturing i mean how many um build to rent tfl build to rent homes do you envisage to be built through off-site manufacturing so th this is my favourite subject by by <laughs> mile, actually. So we. The show Nicky Gavron's not oh, here. Well, <laughs> we don't have time for any more of the session. Yeah. <laughs> so so we've really driven this debate with our um, three parties. Um, we came forward on one of our sites with a modular scheme to drive that debate. So I expect quite a lot of these developments will come forward as modular, which is great news because we can complete the developments somewhere between 30, 20 to 30 percent quicker than using traditional construction. Mm -hmm. Now there is um, some constraints, logistical constraints about whether you can actually get um, longer lorries in etc etc. But beyond that the build to rent world can absorb modular construction in a much more effective way because the absorption rates are a lot quicker so you can build quicker because the stock's taken up quicker. So. Um, that is definitely something that we will be embracing and we've, we've driven it into the tender process. Excellent. Thank you. That's all for me. Okay, um, I've one more question about the, the modular construction and um, how that, because potentially the, the sites that you've outlined, the, the sites in the, I think is it nine sites? Yeah, no, ten, nine sites. Uh, that was the original squad. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They tend to be um, around train stations and, and tube stations yep. in zone three-ish, I think. Now, sites around tube and rail stations, obviously having lots of lorries going around is, is a bad thing. Having lots of vans coming in and out of sites is yep. a bad thing in terms of places where you've got lots of pedestrian traffic. So when you're doing modular construction, this makes construction management, construction safety easier to, to manage. I mean, you've got bigger lorries, but, but less of them. Is this, is this the approach you're taking? Yeah, exactly. Well, well summarised, to be honest with you. I mean, that, that's exactly the approach we'll be taking. I mean, the, the reality is that the developments will be finished quicker, so there's less disruption generally to the area. So actually, for those kind of locations, it's perfectly suited. I mean, we have a, a development around Archway Station that was, I think, completed in less than a year, which traditional construction might have taken double the amount of time mm -hmm. for that. So I, I think it's the perfect kind of solution for these kind of locations. It's part of what we can do with our estate because we can take a long-term view. Because of the numbers of sites we've got, because of the longevity of development programme that we have, we can underpin an investment in modular construction and not just modular construction. That means that the effect of the development pipeline that we've got expands beyond TfL and into the wider industry. We are uniquely well placed in order to support an investment in modular construction, which isn't any cheaper, but it is faster, 
uh, reduced impact on air quality, uh, it's safer, reduced impact on uh, road traffic. There's lots of reasons for doing so, e even if it's not in, in, even if it's not still yet any cheaper. And just finally, um, on this idea of becoming London's largest landlord, I mean, is your, you, you are going to be maintaining a 30-year interest at the very least in these homes. Yeah. People are going to be very aware of the fact that TfL and effectively also the mayor is therefore their landlord. Um, and so getting, getting it right and being good at this is going yeah. to be very important. So more serious, I mean, we're, we're getting excited about the tiles and roundels <laughs> and things, but more seriously, you know, yeah. design principles that are based on, on low maintenance costs, yeah. um, hard wearingness, like you, like you apply to stations. Mixed things, communities. Are things that, yeah, mixing people together, you know, mixed tenure and not having too many carpets, and you don't have carpets in railway stations. Uh, <laughs> all of those things lead to um, sort of benefits of being a landlord as well, don't they? And, and potentially, some sort of branding and excitement from people about living in a Transport for London home. Are you working on all of those things with your partners? Absolutely. Or is their branding the thing that's going to dominate because they're commercial people? No, 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 no. So th this will be a true partnership. So it's not going to be one particular style of branding which is forced on us. So I think we've got to respect the location, the heritage of a particular location. But we've also got to respect the bidder and what they're bringing as well. Mm -hmm. But the branding will be something that comes together along with the management principles, along with the design, along with the, you know, the general approach. Um, and we've really, really scrutinised the bidders from a sort of management and design perspective. It's so important to us if we're leaving a legacy behind to make sure that we've done that work. So we know that each one of these bidders, whichever one we select, kind of really understands our values and shares those values and wants to see those values delivered um, across our portfolio. So it's very important. Can I come in there as well? Go, go for it. I'm just gonna, I was just going to say, we're going to move straight on to small sites now, I'm afraid, Andrew. Would you like to ask the, uh, the questions on small sites after Leanna's speech? What about larger developments? I was going to skip over that just because it's important that we get well, to small sites. Well, I kind of would have liked to... I should have I, stuck I, with my question earlier. I agree with you, but I can't, we can't let Leanna not talk to us about her small sites. I wonder and if we might write. really could have been a bit quicker. I think if I can, I think small no, no, I, the, 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 as chair, um, yeah. can I just suggest that we write to TfL to ask some questions about their partnership? A specific question about that partnership that I'd like answered in the public session. If we push Liana out, I'll be very fed up. I don't want to push up just one question. question, and we can do the rest. How long will it take, Andrew? It, it, the question is: What processes are you shortcutting by having the framework panel? This is a very long answer that Graham can give to them. <laughs> no, it should be very quick. Can you, you do should it, Graham? know what the advantages are of having um, being overruled here. We've got 13 pre-selected bidders. It cuts down by a number of months the, um, the process that one would follow in procuring an individual partner. But I, you and I have discussed in the past uh, the downsides of reducing the procurement process as well as... Um, the time saving. What I would say is we're now increasingly using multiple routes to market. Uh, we work with adjoining partners, we've got Build to Rent as a partner, we work with uh, to do in, 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 in innovative pilots, we use the London Development 2 panel, we've got small sites, so we've got six or seven different routes to market. We're working with 25 partners um, across the piece. Um, the initial property partnerships framework is only one route that we follow and we have to be confident that we're getting best value and have to be confident it's the right answer. We haven't got scheme. time to interrogate this, but it's the bit that interests me most of all, may I say. Um, and um, perhaps you could write with us, because I specifically want to know which processes are being removed, because as far as I can see, you have to go through the same processes with every single developer, whether or not they're in the framework panel or not. So I cannot see the point of the framework panel, and you've, of your four contracts, you have allocated three to one. And that, that concerns me. It concerns me, uh, it'll concern the, the uh, London public as well, that we're having such a narrow field of, of developers who are, who, who are partnering with you, you're going to have to write to me. Yeah. No, I'm sorry, and also because the data came through so late, we've not been able to look properly at the distribution of the sites, and we want to do a bit more analysis do, of and that. We'll happily go through it, and I'm happy to meet you as well, but I would emphasise the fact we've got 25 different partners across our sites.
Sorry. Yeah, we'll, we will come back to this. Assembly member Boff. Um, thank you, Liana, from Community, London Clean and Unity Land Trust for waiting so long. Um, I really wanted to get your take and your opinion on this because you've won the contract to develop two of TfL's small sites that were earmarked for community-led housing. Um, and we want to hear about your experience of that and the progress so far and the potential for this to be delivering more on small sites for mm. TfL. So if I can just turn over the floor to you and ask you to tell us what you think about what's happened so far and how, how your progress is going. Sure. Um, so as I was walking here today, I was thinking it was just around a year ago that we were here with the uh, campaign group from around Shadwell and the campaign group from around Lambeth handing in our bids here at City Hall with our banners. And, and that moment had built on around two years of campaigning in both of those areas. Many conversations about the need for genuinely affordable houses, housing there, coffee mornings, workshops, uh, community walks around the area to identify sites um, and, and campaigning as well, both locally uh, to councillors and to um, Mayor Biggs and Tower Hamlets and, uh, and on the London level as well, lobbying James Murray. And we were really clear from the start that what we wanted was for those sites to deliver housing that was genuinely community-led, um, permanently affordable, so it wouldn't just be affordable for the first people moving in, but for generations to come. And uh, affordable, in a genuinely affordable link to local incomes, what people in the area were actually earning. Um, so the, we heard in June that we'd been successful in getting both the site on Cable Street uh, next to the DLR and a site between Brixton and Streatham on Christchurch Road. And since then, we've been spending lots of time uh, meeting neighbours around the site. So the campaign groups, um, which have been drawn a, a great deal from the organising uh, charity London Citizens, have been doing lots of door knocking, meeting local residents. There's been tremendous appetite uh, from people to, to get involved uh, and excitement about these homes coming. We ran a, uh, a community brief workshop in each of those places. Um, so the community would be setting their priorities for selecting an architect and feeding into the, the tendering for the architect. And most recently, we held to pick the architect workshops where um, four different architect firms turned up to uh, the church St George's in the east in Shadwell and to a uh, church on Brixton Hill and made their pitch and people voted which architect that they wanted to work with to co-design their homes. Um, and it's, it's been a real pleasure to work with people uh, from local mosques, from local schools, from local churches, from local estates, uh, and that process of forming community through discussing the, the homes there. Um, and it's been a really positive experience working with TfL as well. So that initial decision to set aside two of those small sites for community-led affordable housing is something that we, we really welcome. And it's going to be necessary if the mayor's going to meet his ambition of a pipeline of a thousand community-led homes by 2021. And I hope that inspires other public landowners to, to do similarly. Um, the bid process was clear. It wasn't unduly onerous. Um, it was really welcome that TfL said that they welcomed new entrants because if the community-led housing sector is to grow in London, and meet the levels that we see in other European cities, there needs to be that openness to people with less experience than mainstream developers. Can I just ask about that? Because you are new entrants. You, you, you de de delivered the, the first CLT home right. in London. So it's a similar question to Assembly Member Boss. You're now, you're now the only one winning the public's, the, the, the mayor's sites so far. Is that, do you think that's good or bad? And is, is it a good or bad sign? Obviously the three sites, that's not a very large sample size, but is that? A good sign that you won. I know obviously you're pleased you won, but should did you were expecting to win both? Did you expect there to be more variety? We were really pleased to, to win both because that was built on two years of campaigning around each site. And I feel that the the fact that we had 
had an idea of which sites were going to come up when the small sites bid was open because we'd been involved in so much mm -hmm. conversations and campaigning uh, was helpful and I think something that we'd like to see for the to broaden the community-led housing sector in London is more openness about which sites might be coming up in future um, so I think ideally it would be great if um, key actors in the community-led housing sector and key actors in uh, TfL and GLA were to sit down and overlay two maps, one map of where the community-led housing groups are and one map of possible TfL sites to see which sites identify new ones which could come up in possible rounds. And I, and I think the biggest thing is just to make the pie bigger so other community-led housing groups can, can successfully get their first start in the sector as well. And potentially too, to have a, a kind of mirror for the, um, the London Developers Panel. I think it was a, the bid process focused on design plans and finance plans for the site, but also community-led housing groups' capacity to take them on. Yeah. Uh, including experience and we as you say we'd had experience with previous sites but for other community-led housing groups and mo and most of these run on volunteer time run on people spending their evenings um, going through the paperwork that can be difficult so perhaps if it was split out so first of all, there was a kind of pre-qualification stage which laid out a really clear set of goals of how a community-led housing group can qualify to, uh, to bid. Um, and then a second stage, once you were in that panel, to go for a particular site. I think that would uh, cut down on a lot of the waste that happens through a competitive process. Waste, both for community-led housing groups um, to to work up a full bid in six weeks, but also waste for the GLA and TfL who have to go through those applications. Yeah, thank you. That's that's really useful to see. I mean, one of the things that we said earlier was said earlier on was, um, can TfL be more transparent about what, what land it has? I think that might have been me. Um, but but that does ch uh, chime with that, doesn't it? If if the potential potential land, one ones that haven't yet been brought ready could be looked at alongside where the potential for community-led housing groups is. That would be really useful. Yes, and I'd say that, that that should include both small sites, but also looking potentially at bigger sites. Um, our first site, St Clements, came about uh, because in the tender documents there was an insistence that when mainstream developers bid for that land, some of those homes would have to be put aside for community-led housing, so potentially on larger uh, TfL sites, um, a developer could factor into their bid a requirement that community-led housing would be on that site, say so one acre out of 10 acres or 50 homes out of 300 homes. And I think that would be another way of, of really growing the community-led housing sector in, La in London and getting more of ho affordable homes built. There's um, the good political support beginning to come through with the, the Mayor's £38 million. There's the, the funding available. There is so much demand and appetite and enthusiasm from communities to do this. But <coughs> sites coming through is the biggest thing that can unlock more housing yeah, in London. They all, they all need land, don't they? <laughs> sure, sure, good luck can with I? that because, for, uh, because that's been a suggestion the that, the, that the Assembly has had for, for years is that 5% perhaps 5%, perhaps 10% of sites should be laid over to small developers. Uh, but neither mayors in my time, the past two mayors, have acceded to that demand. So it's good to hear that you've, you've stated that. And yeah, say that's that very useful. Yeah. Um, does, can anyone tell me, of the people that we have here, what, what's happening to support the unsuccessful bidders? Because they will have got to the point where they were ready to bid for some land, but they're proposals presumably could be used on other land if that came forward. Is, is anyone keeping an eye on, on them and helping them to just keep an eye out for other land? The community-led housing hub mm -hmm. does a great deal of work offering support and expertise and, and helping groups um, 
scale up and, and prepare to bid. Um, Have you passed on the details to anyone who can help them? Um, <coughs> would be. I'm away. I'm really sorry. Yeah. We're going to need to finish the meeting in a moment because some of our members need to leave. I'm really sorry about that. Um, I would be happy to meet any interested parties. We have good discussions with a number of different sectors, but certainly anyone who wants to talk to me, I would be happy to meet. Can I have one thing on since the bids have been agreed? Um, we've really appreciated the flexibility from TfL in uh, agreeing to sign off uh, the land with a 0% deposit, but a flexibility in principle from the GLA on releasing the grant for the land earlier in the process than normal, which is, is so vital given that unlike standard developers, community-led developers don't always have huge amounts of cash up front, yeah. hasn't translated to flexibility in practice. And we had hoped to have um, this signed off by, uh, by now, and we're frustrated by the delay. Apologies to cut you off there. Um, unless we have four members here, we can't finish our business. So just to carry on finishing our business. Um, I really want to thank our guests for your patience, for telling us so much um, today. It's been really useful. Uh, we will be following up um, questions about um, some of the tenure. So <laughs> we we'll basically have more questions about this table. Um, which we'll follow up with you in writing. Um, we'll hopefully have community housing developers back in the future as well. Um, so thank you. Um, we have um, just to ask the committee to note the report of the discussion and agree to delegate authority to me as chair in consultation with party group lead members to agree any output from the discussion. Agreed. Thank you. Um, can I ask the committee to note the progress on the work programme as I tell in the report. The next meeting is scheduled for the 2nd of April at 10 o'clock in Committee Room 5. And I do not have any other urgent business. That concludes the meeting. Thank you. Thank you.